also really want to encourage everyone to become a member of the American Solidarity Party. Uh, it is very easy. All they want is your email address, and they'll only send you really important stuff, uh, like events like this that are happening, um, information about the national platform. Um, I just filled out a very long survey about all the different items um, in the new uh, platform, um, but they really value your feedback, and as a rising up and coming party, like there's a lot of opportunities to get involved, and if there's something that you don't like, you can uh, let them know about it, and they'll listen to you. Um, and they're really, you know, they're really interested in, in hearing feedback and um, working together to create a platform. So, um, I am, you know, but most of all, I think you're, by signing up to become a member, you're participating in an institution and choosing to build and be a part of something that's uh, positive and trying to uh, be a positive force in American politics and not just criticize. So, that's it. Here goes. There's one thing everybody can agree about in American politics today is that healthcare doesn't work like it's supposed to. We spend more than any other nation in the world on our healthcare system, and yet we don't get much for it. Uh, we rank below most other industrialized nations that we're more comparable to um, in terms of really important indicators of health, like infant mortality, uh, amputations due to diabetes, um, even overall mortality. We pay more, and on average, we die younger um, than other industrialized nations. We, um, we do, I mean, there's still things that we're better at. Um, we have a little bit of an edge in cancer mortality, and we employ way more people um, than anyone else. So we at least we got that covered. <laughs> um, but that's about it. Um, there's a lot of different reasons for this. Uh, very, you know, some more technical things. So, like, we pay our subspecialists by comparison way more than other nations. Um, and we de-emphasize the role of primary care um, in our health systems. Uh, our billing system and the way that the healthcare market works is so opaque and uh, labyrinthine that uh, we spend four times as much on paperwork as the Canadians do. We trap people with massive deductibles and co-pays. Um, that discourage people from getting health care that they need until it's too late. And then we'll pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for someone to keep going to the ER again and again and again before we'd even talk about spending a tenth of that to try to house them. Um, our safety net programs are just kind of a patchwork mess. You know, if you happen to live in the right state and you get signed up and you're good, but you know some qualification somewhere you don't meet, too bad. Um, so those are all things that are a little bit more technical, a little bit more policy-oriented, things that I think could change um, on the political um, end. Uh, but I think that there's also more uh, philosophical, deeper issues that drive a lot of the decisions that we made. And, and the reason why we've got the healthcare system that we have now is because we've been acting according to um, a set of assumptions that took us in this direction. So, um, I think one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest assumptions is that we, we can't agree on what healthcare is for. We don't know what its goals are um, because we don't think about what health is or what it means to, to be healthy um, or, or what, you know, what we do with healthcare. Uh, we don't appreciate the ecosystems of life. We don't appreciate the fact that we are dependent <coughs> on one another, um, on the land, other creatures, not human creatures. Um, and so in eating and moving around, we abuse each other, the land, and the animals. Uh, we live in a culture where personal autonomy reigns supreme. And so self-fulfillment uh, is the chief end of, uh, that's celebrated um, in the world around us. And I think that this uh, makes, makes it such that when vulnerable people or difficult people have health crises, they're often left in the lurch um, because they get in the way of other people fulfilling their inner dreams and desires and, and following their hearts. And then we concentrate power in the hands of highly educated and wealthy professionals and are surprised when then you know, patients feel disempowered um, and disconnected from um, the system where money is being transferred on their behalf from one wealthy 
professional to another, um, but it never touches them and they don't really get much decision about what to do with it or how to use that power. And then lastly, uh, when, it, when we do try to think about what health is, uh, we end up defining it down to these very scientifically reductionist uh, measures. You know, whatever we, if we can measure it, it matters. Um, and if, it, if we can sell a pill or a treatment for it, we can build for it, then it really matters. Um, that, <laughs> if, it, if you can't measure it, it, it can't matter. Um, and if you can't sell a pill or treatment for it, then um, no one really cares. Unless you, you, know, you have to force yourself to care about it. It's, it's something extra to be asked on um, after you do the thing that you get to build for. So, all of these things, I think, flow out of um, the way that we think about health and what we think about what health is for uh, and our failure to recognize health as wholeness in community. Wendell Berry points out that health and whole and hail, they all come from the same root word and that they're all connected to each other. Um, it's impossible to think about our wholeness in persons and fulfilling the uh, role that God has given us in the earth without thinking about our wholeness um, and health in our bodies. Uh, our flourishing is always embodied. Um, so when we don't treat our bodies like they're connected to our souls, and we don't think about the purpose of our bodies or what it means to flourish, um, then we start to go off the rails. And the same even more when we disconnect our bodies from the places that we live, the land, I think even people who talk about health care as a right, um, and want to make sure that everyone has a lot of health care fall into these kinds of traps. Uh, I think they're a little bit closer to the right idea than Paul Ryan, um, for whom the chief end of health care is tax cuts um, and, uh, and choices, you know, like giving health insurers the choice to charge you more money for something that you need to survive. Um, but even if you if you do, you know, want to advocate for the poor, and you talk about health care as a right, um, I think it's that's really confusing because um, yeah, health care isn't just like one thing that you have that takes that someone can take away from you. Um, it's a whole monopoly of goods and services that are in service of your health. Uh, so, um, plus people that um, think that you know everyone should have a lot of health care and that it's a right. Um, often want the government to make sure you are as free from obligations to other people as possible. Except maybe the obligation to sell somebody something, even if it goes against your beliefs. So I think a more helpful framework um, is not to call health care a right, but to call it a social good that is necessary to secure one's right to life. I think we can agree that people have a right to life, unless you're totally not into rights at all, which is not a topic for another day. Um, so, Rights are things the government has to protect at any cost, but social goods are things that we value and share and use um, on the basis of our obligations to one another um, as human beings, not just things that we trust that the state has to control um, and protect. Um, if we understand that as citizens, the physical bodies of our fellow citizens matter and are valuable, and have God given dignity, um, then we have to care for them by contributing together and working together um, and sharing the social good of healthcare. So, if we go with this understanding that healthcare is a social good necessary to secure the right to life, it follows that every person should be able to access healthcare so that way they don't lose their life um, when they otherwise, otherwise could have um, lived. Um, so any health system in which people die preventable, otherwise preventable deaths simply for lack of access to healthcare, I think is unjust. And I think our current system is unjust because it doesn't meet this very basic test. Um, I don't think this is utopian to say that we should ensure that everyone has access. Um, it's it's a fairly straightforward matter of figuring out how to do it in the way with the fewest trade-offs. Um, if you're an adult in America who doesn't have a job that gives you health insurance, um, and you have a condition, you either develop it all of a sudden or um, slowly over time, 
Um, and that condition requires you to take expensive medications to keep from dying or being disabled. Um, it's really easy, actually, to die while you're waiting um, to become poor enough or disabled enough to qualify for treatment. Um, there's a lot of other goals that you can fall through, um, but I think that's the biggest one and the one that's hardest for most health systems to deal, you know, this relatively small population of people um, who will die without a fairly intensive degree of care and investment. Um, but because these are fellow human beings that we're talking about, regardless of whether or not we think they deserve it, um, and, you know, many people, you know, did not do anything to cause their suffering in the first place, um, I think we have to work together to try to keep these people, give these people as much help um, as they can, help them live the life, um, the best life that they can. Uh, in these circumstances, charity might possibly step in. Um, but if you're talking about medications or treatment in the range of tens of thousands of dollars, um, which again, you know, if you think about like um, children with uh, severe disabilities um, or adults who uh, have developed these chronic autoimmune conditions, you know, very disabling um, but treatable things like Crohn's or multiple sclerosis, um, charity uh, just is rarely going to be enough to cover the cost of things. Um, and it's not really sustainable across the whole population. Um, I think if any idea is utopian, it's the idea that self-interest and massive power concentrated in insurance companies and hospitals will somehow keep everybody healthier, uh, and then charity will be there for anybody who needs it when they do. Okay. So, um, there's often a lot of cynicism about changing the healthcare system, because it is really massive, um, and there's a lot of different problems with it. And I think a lot of people feel like there's nothing else to do. Um, obviously, I think the system, as it is, discourages people from thinking holistically um, and actively works against some of the uh, ways in which you could be reformed uh, to do better. But I also think that there's a lot we can do, regardless of our political realities, which, quite frankly, could change at any moment, <laughs> depending on how certain people feel um, or what happens. Um, and there's a lot that we would have to do even if we woke up and had a single care system tomorrow. I think as a clinician, I have met many people who had Medicaid, food stamps, um, Section 8 housing. They had everything that they needed, uh, but they didn't, they were still not very healthy. Uh, and they, there were still a deep, um, a lot of very deep things keeping them from living the life that they could have otherwise lived um, had they uh, and the poor the people around them chosen. I think about a woman um, that I took care of in residency who had HIV and she was um, so ashamed of her diagnosis that she um, couldn't bring herself to tell anyone in her family or her friends and she she just before she lied to her doctors about taking her medication, um, and just the you know we and we threw everything at her. You know she had access, um, but she had you know her community was broken. You know she had various family members that took advantage of her, um, and so there was you know there was more to her health than just having access to all of this um, stuff. Um, she never would have gotten better if she couldn't have, if, if she couldn't access the HIV meds. Uh, but she needed more than just the medication from the doctors and a place to live and food. Uh, so um, before I talk about what we can change outside of like the political systems, I do want to mention single payer because um, this is an ASP event. The official ASP platform calls for a national single payer system. They are tweaking the language though, so again, it's no reason to join. Um, <laughs> to have a to have a voice about that, um, like, so we'll we'll see what we'll comes forth in the next couple of weeks. Again, please sign up. Um, uh, I don't want to talk about everything about single, you know, that's not about, about single payer healthcare, but I do feel like I have to mention it and some other alternatives um, because I think single payer solves um, the very basic problem of you know giving everybody access. Uh, it solves a lot of other problems like the paperwork problem. 
Um, it creates other problems and it doesn't solve some of the biggest problems that I mentioned, um, but it meets the basic test of justice that I have. Again, if you have health care, the social good, necessary to the right to life, and everybody should be able to access it enough in order to survive. Um, so a single pair gets you there. Um, some version of expanding the ACA, uh, which is kind of like in France or Germany, where basically every, everyone kind of gets subsidized to the point that they can all buy insurance. Uh, there's also uh, a bill that has been drafted but not ever to a vote um, called Cassidy Collins uh, after its two sponsors uh, that automatically enrolls everybody in America in a catastrophic plan that protects you from the biggest things and then everyone else can either buy insurance on their own or get it from their employer or use HSAs to health savings accounts um, to get other things that they want or need. Um, so that way there's still a lot more choice in the healthcare market. I think this one, you know, she crossed out that called it uh, Make America Singapore. Because um, <laughs> it's the closest related to the Singaporean um, system, the way that they do it is there is a lot more of like markets and choices and things like that. Um, that's the one that's probably most appealing to conservatives, I think, that um, meets the basic test of justice. But again, you know, there are options, there's a way of doing things. Um, but single payer is certainly the simplest way to, to move forward. Um, then, but what if none of that happens? And uh, our system keeps slipping along or it, as it is, or gets even worse when Paul Ryan gives you more choice. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I love about the ASP um, is that uh, while uh, members of the party are convinced that government policy affect every area of life in one way or the other, um, we are equally certain that the government can't um, do the work of flourishing and um, loving that other that individuals and intermediate institutions um, can do. Um, the government marks off the boundaries of the ways that we interact with each other, um, kind of you know sets the stage for the lives that we live, um, but it doesn't make us flourish or fail for the most part. Um, People in Washington can make it easier or harder for us to love our neighbors, um, but there's a lot that we have to do ourselves, and there's a lot that belongs to um, these intermediate institutions um, that, unfortunately, in America have been getting weaker and weaker um, over the last couple of decades. Um, so, regardless of what Paul Ryan does, there are decisions we can make in hospitals and clinics and families and churches and neighborhood organizations and local political parties um, that help us care for one another and honor the bodies God has given us. Um, so how do we do that? Um, I think we, we've talked about health, its wholeness um, in ourselves, and it's being acknowledging our inter interdependence with one another and the land and the community. Um, and I think it's also stewardship. We have the resources within ourselves, within the earth, um, to take care of ourselves, um, and to live healthy lives, and deal with a lot of the natural disasters that occur you know, in our bodies uh, and manage the resources God has given us. So we just have to distribute these resources wisely. Um, and so I think the best way to heal our, help our ailing body politic um, is to distribute our resources wisely so that people can make better choices. By now the power in healthcare is concentrated um, in payers you know, with all the money, like the government, health insurance companies, <laughs> And then the decision-making power is really concentrated on hospitals and doctors and these big medical conglomerates that own a bunch of clinics. Um, these big entities spend a lot of time and money trying to convince people to eat healthy, exercise, take their medications, comply with what they tell you to do um, when they're not spending time trying to lobby to make sure that their income is protected. Um, and all the other institutions, your, your friends, family and your community and your work, um, all of those um, are generally taken for granted uh, when it comes to thinking about what makes people healthy or unhealthy. Um, and in turn, your friends and your church and all those other institutions, they take your health for granted. But they assume that's the doctor's job. Um, and so they don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what it is, unless you, you know, have a very serious <coughs> need um, that people are take care of before. Because um, that's the doctor's job. And then a lot of people end up taking their own health for granted when there's so much power 
concentrated in these other more abstract institutions, um, then you become a consumer of healthcare, passively sort of throwing yourself at the doctor. Um, and I see this all the time, people that are like, well, just, just fix it, doctor. I'm here. I have you for 15 minutes. You have the whole rest of your life to be healthy um, and take care of yourself. <laughs> There's a couple of things, little things that I can do, um, but the rest of it is, is your work. Um, so, uh, but I think it is possible that we can be stewards of our bodies. All these challenges are even harder in poor communities um, where there are more structural challenges to be healthy. When there's a lack of access to fresh food, um, no safe places for kids to play, um, and then tons of tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and unhealthy foods available um, to deal with when you feel stressed from your life of poverty. Um, so when that's the milieu that you live in, then it's a lot harder um, to resist the urge to misuse substances, and it's a lot harder to do what is necessary to take care of your body and to take care of other people's bodies around you. Um, and then so you end up passively surrendering yourself to the medical system if you do have to have access to health care, um, or you're trying to find a way to get into it um, by hook or by crook um, to do it. And then a lot of the you know, liberal solutions to these problems, I think, are wealth transfers on behalf of the poor. Um, so, you know, you, uh, tax, you, know, you raise your taxes, and then um, you, the government sends money to your landlord, um, who does, probably doesn't even love your state if you're on Section 8. Um, they send money to the doctor, uh, if you've been paid. Um, and then the power and the money just kind of bypasses. So then I think we have to redistribute power from these bigger, more imprecise institutions. Um, the places that we do need to call upon when we have an expensive or difficult um, disease um, to all the smaller institutions, um, places that know you and love you, uh, especially when it comes to primary and preventive care. So this, so now kind of focusing primarily on primary care, um, so, you know, the stuff that you would see, you would just call your doctor, your primary care doctor, and say, hey, I need this, um, and preventive care, the things that everybody agrees that need to be done in order to stay healthy if you are healthy. Um, so, um, a lot of that doesn't need to be done by a doctor, but a lot of it is done by doctors, because doctors got used to doing this, I guess. Um, and now um, it lets them keep making money. And it's easy, so they keep doing it. But I think community health workers are um, a lot better than doctors at knowing people in the community, uh, and helping them figure out how to prevent disease, so how to eat healthy, um, exercise, quit smoking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and quite frankly, um, you don't need four years of medical school to order a colonoscopy for somebody who's 50 or um, order vaccines. Um, as long as someone doesn't have a contraindication, then you can go ahead and do it. Okay. These are things that have little check boxes that you check off. Okay, this person is this age, they have these risk factors, excuse me, um, they should do this. It is very simple, and yet for a primary care doctor like me, it occupies a lot of my day, just clicking these boxes, and then reminding people about putting smoke. That is not why I did seven years in <laughs> medical education. Um, but it's, it's, it's what I end up doing. And sometimes, okay, so nurse practitioners and PAs are doing this more and more because people are figuring out, hey, we don't have to pay NPs and PAs the same you know, amount that we pay doctors to do this very basic stuff. But not even NPs and PAs. Like, they have too much medical education to be doing, wasting their time doing that stuff. Um, and then pushing it even further. So other like primary care stuff, things that you do when you're, you're even getting into some secondary care stuff. So. so when you have a very um, simple, straightforward disease um, that's common, diabetes, hypertension, um, common colds, back pain, those kinds of things, like, again, like they've done a lot of research on a lot of people. There are lists and check boxes and things, best practices. And uh, the more education you get, the more you think, oh, I can break these things. <laughs> so you end up spending more money doing things that don't need to be done 
They don't help people. Um, so probably community health workers can do that. And in other countries, they do. And they save money, you know, or like in the UK. Um, in Canada, you just get something in the mail when it's time for your colonoscopy. You don't have to go to the doctor's office for him to say, yes, you are 50 years old and otherwise healthy. You need a colonoscopy. Let me order it for you. Anyway. What? <laughs> and then, yes, yeah, the insurance, the insurance yes, for here. I have, I will, let me charge you $125 for the service of having told you that you are healthy and you need this thing to stay. Um, so, at that point, when you're doing, once you get to that point, then you're really starting to cut into the doctor's business and you have to start dealing with local and state legislatures um, to change licensure issues. Um, but, there you go. Um, and the problem with this is that, you know, like most other um, elite uh, professionals, doctors are rent seekers. You know, they want to be ensconced in their um, protective um, rentier class bubble and charge money, you know, make sure that they have licensure and everything protecting their incomes. Um, but again, it's, it's not promoting health to be paying doctors to be doing that stuff. You know, people who have seven years of medical education should be dealing with complex and difficult things that use that education, not checking boxes. Um, because, again, you know, treating very basic diseases, um, doing primary care and preventive care, um, you can do that with a high school education. And quite frankly, if that's all you have, then maybe people might trust you better than the doctor. Um, and might understand where you're coming from and be able to deal with more issues um, that are going on that are preventing you from quitting smoking or taking your medicine every day and that kind of stuff. So um, I think hospitals and clinics should be funding them, um, and they do a little bit. There's, I know, a couple dozen um, community health workers in Maryland. <clears throat> uh, one of the most exciting programs is actually out of um, Johns Hopkins Bayview. It's, the, uh, it's called the uh, Lay Health Educator Program, and that's where they have medical residents, social workers, hospital chaplains, uh, doctors, nurses, come and train people from local churches who uh, are already kind of active in their communities and trusted um, to learn basic preventive health skills. Um, so that's, I think, a great example of taking power that was concentrated in the hospital. This information um, and expertise that you would normally have to go to the hospital or to the doctor's office to get, and then spreading that out into the community and empowering somebody in the community to better take care of their neighbors. Um, obviously, I don't think it goes far enough because they can't order colonoscopies, but um, I think it's exactly what we need a lot of. I also mentioned that program specifically. Um, it's run by Dr. Daniel Kale, who wrote the book um, on medical religious partnerships um, that you can look up. Of building medical religious partnerships. And um, he is a fantastic guy, um, has a lot of great ideas in that book. Um, a lot of it is similar to the Lay Health Educator Program, where, you know, the, um, where the medical institution has knowledge um, and power in that, um, and also money, um, and they kind of shift that over to the religious institution, which has connections in the community and a certain amount of authority and trust. Um, but there's other things, you know, uh, health sponsoring health fairs in churches, locating things in the community, maybe even trying to deliver health services and screenings and things like that more regularly in community settings, uh, which I think is important. Um, another kind of big picture uh, or, or a bigger institutional um, response uh, is taken by the Christian Community Health Fellowship. It's a network of, of explicitly Christian clinics um, that are intentionally locate themselves in the community's of greatest need. Um, one of the biggest um, and you know, best success stories in this network is in the Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago, uh, which has uh, you know, been very uh, astute in uh, raising funds and uh, working with the community to develop a clinic. So they, they deliver health services in their clinic, but they also have a cafe and a fitness center um, and do a lot of um, events with the community and working closely with local churches. Um, which I think gets at the idea that health is homeless. And it's about stewarding all the resources in the community and not just trying to deliver services um, with a Christian label on it. Um, so, um, and then 
you know, so moving from the bigger institutional level stuff, um, I think we can do it on an even smaller level too, like just among um, friends and people. In Japan, um, I just learned about this the other day um, on the Solidarity Hall podcast. Uh, the Solidarity Hall, the Solidarity Hall um, folks, I think are um, kissing cousins with the ASP. So um, in Japan, they have these health co-ops um, based out of what they call Han groups. They're just a couple of um, people who get together to check their blood pressure and um, talk about preventive health care things together, um, doing health education and encouraging one another. Um, so professionals do help to kind of supervise um, and occasionally participate in these groups. But again, the focus is on what people can do for themselves and not just what you do when you go to the clinic. Um, where I saw this happening the best in um, Sandtown, in West Baltimore, uh, where my family and I lived for six years, um, was in regards to mental health. We had a real heart to try to deal with mental health needs in the community, and we tried a lot of different things to help. We brought in counselors, and we held events, um, and we you know, really tried to advertise and get the word out that you know, people can come and take care of advantage of services, um, and not a lot of work. Um, but the thing that did work was when uh, we trained some people in the community to do support groups. Um, a few ladies in the church went through a program called Community Health Education, or CHE. It's a worldwide uh, program that does all kinds of educational and vocational um, training, and, uh, some religious stuff too. So it's about, um, so for example, they'll use it for um, doing safe and healthy births in rural or remote settings. Um, people who don't necessarily have access to health care um, can't get to a clinic or a hospital necessarily. <coughs> They'll talk about, okay, this is, these are the things that you need to have a safe baby birth. This is what to do um, for the baby, to help the baby breathe when they come out. When this is what to do, or this is how you recognize a situation that requires a doctor. So, you know, how to do. And, and you know, again, basic hygiene, um, sanitation, um, treating common illnesses, that kind of stuff. Jay's main focus is always on, like, what can people do for themselves? And what can, you know, regardless of sort of the forces out there, what do you think your own problems are within the community? What can you do? Um, so in Sandtown, um, they had access to some curriculum that talked about, you know, basically dealing with um, common mental health issues and helping you know, people walk through grief or trauma or stress, those kinds of things. Um, and they would have this support group every month, um, led, just kind of led by one of the people who's gone through the training. Um, I wasn't able to get people to go to the counselor, but a lot of their groups. So, um, and it was something people could do for themselves once they had access to the curriculum and leaders have been trained. So all of these kind of different ideas, whether it's trying to like shift power from the doctors um, to community health workers and parish nurses, uh, or uh, trying to you know encourage um, clinics and health systems to do more than just kind of delivering these basic services. Um, all of that I think is about distributing power and knowledge downwards so that people can live healthier lives and take care of them. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to happen, I think, at the very top level. Um, we need to have a more just system, um, a less insane um, healthcare system, uh, however you want to do that. Again, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to go about it. Um, you know, things need to happen at the level of medical organizations, so the state boards, um, in terms of this commitment, less to protecting your own income and more about um, doing what is um, efficiently distributing resources. Um, and then, you know, pushing some of the money and power um, downward. Um, one other idea I think that would be really cool is if, uh, you know, there was a bit more flexibility when it came to health spending. You we're know, so, you know, talking about the value of HSAs, which, you know, is another Republican talking point that actually makes a little bit more sense. Um, now, if you have, again, if you, you know, need $50,000 a year to cover your medications, <laughs> it's not going to help you. Um, an HSA is not going to do it. Um, but what if you could use an HSA for whatever the doctor said? 
um, and sign up. You know, if you're coming into the ER with asthma um, four or five times throughout the winter, and you know, the doctor said, well, just go get your ducts clean, and that kept you out of the ER. You use your HSA for that. That makes a lot more sense to use tax-free money for things for health. Um, or if people from um, a community could pool their HSAs together um, to you know, build a little park near them or something like that. I think there's a lot of different options, again, if we are willing to be creative and flexible um, about and trust people to um, use the power that they have when you give it to them um, instead of just telling them what to do while you hold all the power. Um, and again, um, that bottom-up change, just as important, or maybe even more important, than some of the top-down changes. Um, every uh, individual person, each body uh, in our body politic uh, has a history and a trajectory to it. Every person that you, every person in this room, uh, has spent a great deal of lives, of their, a great deal of their life dependent, like Leo and Henry. Um, for the first several years of your life, and most of us at the last years of our life will be totally dependent on other people. Um, and there are some people who never quite reach a level of independence um, in their life, and they're always in some way dependent on other people. And everyone in this room, regardless of how you know, functional um, and healthy you are, you're still interdependent with other people. Um, and so I think healing our healthcare system and healing and promoting health requires that we um, recognize our interdependence with one another, um, choose to embrace it, so that we love and cherish uh, other people's bodies, and then do what is necessary um, in order to uh, project that trajectory of someone's life and honor the dignity.